In the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis, will the world of work ever return to normal? Is it time for businesses to come to terms with remote working and the permanent digitization of the workplace? And with the advent of automation, virtual reality and artificial intelligence, what exactly are humans at risk of losing to machines? Today, we are joined by Professor William Kerr, Professor of B Business Administration at Harvard Business School and co-director of Harvard's Managing the Future of Work Initiative. We're also joined by Professor Nancy Rothbard, Chair of the Management Department, and David Potrick, Professor of Management at Wharton Business School. And finally, we have Professor Kate Kellogg, Professor of Management and Innovation at the MIT Sloan School of Management, specializing in organizational change and employment models. Thank you all so much for taking the time today to speak to us about the future of work. I wanted to start off by giving us an overview of where we're at with the global pandemic and the kind of effects this will have on the future of work. So Nancy, do you maybe want to start us off by telling us what you think the future of work will look like? Sure. Um... Thank you, Luisa. It's a pleasure to join you here today. So obviously, I think all of us are affected by the, this global pandemic, uh, and it's really radically um, shocked our systems uh, in terms of how we work and how we engage with others at work. And you know, one of the things that I think is uh, uh, really emblematic of that is that I'm guessing all of us are at home right now, uh, you know, doing this podcast. Uh, and so, um, you know, this is, this has been a very rapid change. Um, but it's one that's affected, I think, different types of workers differently, right? So for knowledge workers like us, we've been able to uh, go home and, and somewhat seamlessly, uh, you know, with a few bumps in the road, do our, our work reasonably well, but for you know the the more frontline workers, people who are who don't have that luxury, I think that this has been a very different shock. And so um, it, it's almost that there's a divergence, I think, in the in terms of the the ways that this pandemic will affect different types of workers. And I think that's really important for us to consider. Maybe I'll go next. And again, thank you for hosting us and having us on this uh, this podcast. Uh, echoing many of, of Nancy's thoughts, I'll, I'll add something that I would have had as a big part of the future of work before COVID, uh, and it will certainly be a big part afterwards, which is us as a, a workforce, us as firms, us as society, really trying to match the supply and demand of workers with job opportunities, making sure people have the right skill sets, those that have maybe older skill sets, how can we retrain them and prepare them for what is going to be expected tomorrow? And as I'm sure we're going to unpack today during our conversation, I think COVID has accelerated a lot of change that we've been experiencing in the technology space. And so that's just going to increase the premium uh, for us being able to accomplish uh, these tasks. Another thing that was, I think, really kind of Im Im implicit or part of what Nancy was describing is we're you know, trying to make sure that we can have an equitable distribution of returns and rewards across society. And that's one that was a, a already in question before COVID. Uh, and we're going to have to think about how we can uh, ensure that that after COVID and beyond for the future of work, that people are getting their, their fair share. Yeah. So uh, just to uh, echo two things here. One is I think it's really shown that the essential workers here are the workers on the front lines. So the future of work involves um, making sure that they have the pay and protections that they deserve. I think it's also accelerated what was already happening in terms of a move to automation and remote work. And then finally, I think it shows uh, the need for upskilling of workers and there's a lot of new opportunities for asynchronous on the job uh, training because of these new technologies. So you all already touched on um, the special kind of remote working situation we're experiencing. And also the significant unemployment, I think, is quite oh, quite important. We see 40 million um, unemployed people now in the U.S. How do you think companies have responded to these challenges, both in terms of remote working and having to let some of their employees go? And do you think these responses were successful? 
Kate, maybe do you want to start us off with this one? Uh, no, I, I'll, I'll have William start that off because I think that's more okay. his area and I can <laughs> jump in after. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think at this point, it's hard to separate out what's going to be great leadership versus not so great leadership. And I think the, the, really the way I think of the first few months that happened after the, the crisis emerged was a lot of trying to, to get your company and your, your ship stabilized. And clearly some industries were decimated by this. Other industries were more protected from, from the crisis. Um, but then if you look within that industry space, what leaders had to do, a lot of it was about cash flow management, making sure the business stayed solvent, trying to right size some of the operations for what's been happening. And I don't know that um, it, it's hard to point to something at this point that we know that that was a fantastic thing for leaders to have done versus this was an awful thing. As we go through the summer, I think you're going to increasingly see greater separation across leadership teams as to what was the what, what were they doing behind the scenes over the last few months to either facilitate the workflow that had to happen inside their organization uh, to make sure that any changes they had to do with the workforce were done in the correct uh, manner and how to build uh, to build from that. I guess I will give one uh, a company that we have talked to about what they're doing. And since this is a UK podcast, uh, it being Unilever, it's a good, uh, I think, a good example. Uh, Unilever has worked a lot on its future of work plans and also trying to help employees think about their purpose. And one of the things I've appreciated over the, the course of the coronavirus is that they've been pushing their employees to go back to, to those things, like try to rethink even harder about what is their, the purpose that they're bringing to the workplace. Uh, and then also how can they, because the, again, as we'll be describing technologies accelerating and so forth, how can they make sure that they're doing even better towards reskilling and, and preparing themselves for the next step? Yeah. Um, and so let me jump in here uh, with some other things I've seen, again, going back to this idea of there being uh, kind of this divide in the types of workers. So I study healthcare, and for the knowledge workers, I've seen a real move to telemedicine and delivering a lot of these services online. And it's been really impressive how quickly the telemedicine uh, companies were able to adjust to this and deliver this care in a very different way. And it was also inspiring to see how that required a lot of changes in regulations and reimbursement in order to make that work and, and how people really stepped up to the crisis to do that. I think um, with the frontline workers, what we've seen is really needing to staff up those jobs and a lot of interventions around making sure that there's adequate protections for the people who are on the front line. So one thing that was very challenging was making sure that there was enough PPE, personal protective equipment for those workers. And what the crisis highlighted is that there are a lot of supply chain issues associated with that. So there's been a lot of focus for frontline workers on how can we get them the adequate equipment? How can we get them the adequate pay? do the really important work that they're doing on the front lines during the crisis. You want to jump in, Louisa? Sure. I was actually going to go to you because I uh, you, you specifically in your research sort of distinguish between segmenters and integrators and how this whole crisis is affecting them differently. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just, I think that, you know, the points that Bill and Kate brought up are really, I think, essential. And one of the things that has been, I think, really challenging for organizations to deal with through this crisis has been just a massive uncertainty. Um, you know, so it, you know, I really, I really like Bill's point that we don't really know what the outcome of some of these leadership actions is even now, right? Because of the just the continuing, ongoing, massive uncertainty that we're all experiencing, and and not necessarily knowing if our strategic moves are the right ones, right? Because you know, it, it's such a novel situation that we find ourselves in. One of the things that, um, though, that that we we really have seen more of in in this situation, obviously, is this work from home. You know, many of us have been. Uh, you know, I've been here since early March in my home, uh, sitting here in my kitchen, which is where I am right now, um, and you know, working. And you know, lots and lots of other people have experienced this in, in many uh, firms. And so 
how do we really think about the way that we work both individually and collectively in this new environment, right? Where we are, first of all, um, very blessed to have the kinds of technologies and technological advances that Bill and Kate were referring to, right? You know, that, that, that companies have been able to step up and, and, you know, already we had, I think a, a lot, a host of, you know, technological advances that made this possible. But, you know, even so, you know, having refined uh, uh, technologies that have enabled us to work um, both independently and collectively from these remote locations. You know, there have been studies that have shown that remote work can, you know, be very productive. You know, people can be very productive when they're working remotely, but it has to be managed uh, effectively, right? You can't, it, it, what, one of the difficult things I think with the, the COVID situation is it, it, it was this abrupt shock and everybody sort of had to go home, you know, no, uh, regardless of whether they wanted to or not. You know, people who love the office are now working from home. And we're not just working from home by ourselves, we're working from home a lot of times with uh, our fellow family members, right? So my children are right above me in, in the rooms above me uh, on online, doing online school right now. My husband is you know, also a professor and was teaching online this spring, right? And so all of us were doing this together in our, you know, our house. And fortunately we had enough rooms and we had good internet access so that we were able to, to do this without tremendous disruption. But, you know, that really poses a, a challenge for people. From the integration segmentation uh, perspective that you mentioned, I've done a lot of research on sort of people's work styles and preferences around whether you blur the boundary between work and home or whether you try to keep a very distinct um, separation between those domains. And, and people really do vary quite a lot on how comfortable they are with the blurring, right? I'm an integrator, thus I'm sitting in my kitchen. If I were a segmenter, this would be the worst place for me to be sitting right now even though the internet is the best here, right? So I'm here because I'm drawn to the really good internet uh, and I don't really mind if my kids walk behind me uh, occasionally when I'm in a meeting, right? For other people who are more, um, who are less comfortable with that, trying to find the time and the space for them to structure their work more effectively is absolutely critical. And this is a very challenging time for people who are segmenters. If you are somebody who likes to keep your work and home separate, you are not happy right now. And you're, you're really trying to find ways to recreate that separation, uh, to recreate an office, both in terms of your own space, but also in terms of the way that you connect with people at work. And so I think that, um, you know, these are challenging times for all of us, but even more challenging for some, depending on these different preferences for how you manage your work and your non-work identities. So you already mentioned that a lot of people are working from home and that this obviously was something that was not something that people necessarily wanted, but that it was just due to the pandemic. But do you think that these kind of, developments will stay with us long term? Will there be more people working from home? And was it something that people already wanted beforehand that the crisis just enabled them to do? Those are really great questions, Louisa. And, and there's, a, there's a couple of them in there, right? So I'll, I'll unpack them, right? So, and remind me if I forget about one of them. So, uh, so the first question uh, that I think is really relevant is, were people working from you know remotely or from home before? And the answer is yes. You know there, there there's been a long tradition of remote work. Uh, as soon as we got the technologies that have enabled us to connect, uh, you know, fast internet, uh, you know, smartphones, you know, all sorts of advances in connection technologies we have really seen growth in remote work, right? And so technology has really been enabling this, this move. 
Okay, so that's definitely uh, been a trend. And there have been studies that have shown that people can be quite productive in, in remote work settings um, and even more productive sometimes, especially if they were the ones who wanted to work from home, right? So the studies that have looked at this have all looked at people who have essentially said, I, I, you know, I want to do this. And they've put their hands up and they've, you know, and then they, they've been, um, you know, the, the, the companies let them do that. So there's a really great study by Nick Bloom and colleagues out of Stanford that looks at a Chinese call center uh, that showed a really uh, dramatic increase in productivity from those folks who wanted to work from home and then were allowed to do so. There's a nice study uh, from Bill's colleague at Harvard, Raj, uh, who is actually my former colleague here at Wharton, so I know Raj well, uh, on, on work from anywhere uh, that he has uh, done looking at the US patent office examiners, right? So there's lots and lots, I think, of um, really strong evidence that work from home can be effective. But there's a couple of key conditions, right? This consent of the workers, right? That this is something you want is really important. The other piece that I think is important to recognize though is that some of the mechanisms that they have identified are people actually work longer when they're working remotely, right? So it's not necessarily that work from home means you work less, it sometimes means you work more. And I think that's what a lot of people have been experiencing during this COVID situation, right? I know, I know for me and my colleagues, the work day has extended um, the one benefit is we're not commuting, right? So we're taking, we're taking that commute time and we're adding it to our work day more explicitly. Um, you know, there are also other um, pieces in terms of that work that had looked at productivity and work from home about why it's effective is that you have fewer distractions. That is not always the case, I think, during the COVID situation, especially given um, what your family situation might be, right? If you have small children, this is incredibly disruptive, right? Uh, for my colleagues and for people that I've, you know, talked to in organizations who have women, especially, this has been challenging. Uh, women with small children, uh, even more so. People in jet families in general with small children, right? This is this has been a very very challenging kind of period, and so some of those benefits we see. Uh, from remote work more generally are not necessarily being realized, I think, in this period, possibly. That said, you asked a second question about, you know, will we see more of this in the future? And, and I actually think we will, because despite all of these challenges, the relative smoothness of the transition to work from home, I mean, I loved Kate's example of how telemedicine stepped up, right? To really, um, you know, change the game of medicine, right? And how medicine is practiced. I will give you a personal example. My kids had a telemedicine appointment yesterday and it was amazing. You know, it was, it was a checkup. It was something that they didn't need to do, you know, like anything physical with them. She did have them go up really close to the screen so she could see their throat and their noses, right? I'm not sure what she saw, but you know, they sounded okay. So I think she was good, right? But like, you know, when we think about the changes to work that this shock has provided, I think doctors are not gonna go back, right? I mean, telemedicine in places where it's appropriate is going to really, I think, I think see a huge rise. And that's a great example. And I think we're gonna see that in other areas too. One of the biggest barriers to remote work has always been a, a, a problem of trust from the manager perspective, where managers are not sure what their workers are doing. And so they're worried about that. The second barrier, and, and because of that, they may not be promoting it, right? So even though the company has a remote work policy, a flex work policy, you know, if your manager doesn't think you should be doing this, you're not going to be doing it, right? That's going to impede your promotion if your manager is not happy with you doing this, right? But I think that a lot of managers are starting to see a, a huge um, advantage to this, or that people can actually do this, and that they can that, that they can pull together uh, and do this uh, with goodwill and um, effectiveness.
So I'll stop there. I mean, I'm sure I can say more. I could go on for a long time about this, but I'll let others uh, weigh in or, or if you have any other questions. I, I guess one, one thing I'll say in response is, um, Nancy was talking a lot about the current workforce and how they move remotely. But one thing I wonder is whether this remote work is gonna accelerate a trend toward freelancing that was already started with labor market platforms. So now that companies are seeing that a lot of this work can be done so effectively remotely, are they going to continue to try to keep their current workers and redeploy them in creative ways? Or are they going to be using the labor market platforms more to match to the skills they need in particular situations? Um, and if we do see the move toward freelancing, then we we have a lot of issues come up that we saw before on labor market platforms. So for example, that's great for workers in terms of their flexibility, uh, in terms of their matching to employers, but it also raises issues around social isolation, pay, worker protection. So I just think that it does raise this whole question of whether we really are gonna see the current workforce all remotely or whether we're gonna see more change to this labor market platform situation. I, I echo many of the things that Nancy and Kate uh, just mentioned, all the way down to telemedicine for kids. We have a seven-year-old and nine-year-old, and having done the doctor's appointment, you know, virtually, you're like, why have we been in those waiting rooms all that time with all the drives back and forth? Let me, let me uh, offer maybe two counter pieces to the conversation, agreeing with with everything that was just uh, was just said. First, I think we're going to have to see over the summer how well we do when we're not really relying as much on pre-existing teams and work structures that we took remote. And us, the three of us being all in, um, in academics, and we, we took my class virtual in early March. But it was a class that we'd already spent six, seven weeks in the classroom together before we were trying to do it virtually. And I think we'll have a lot of challenges when we have to you know, bring people into brand new teams from the very beginning, recreate workflows, uh, recreate classrooms where you don't have that kind of, you know, guys, we have to take this offline now or, you know, you know actually online now. We have to take this online now, um, and, but you already have the relationships there. I think the other thing for us to re remember for the future is that uh, while we could have an increasing share of remote work, it doesn't mean that place is going to become unimportant. Uh, and I, I, I kind of like to think about technologies like the telephone and email, both of which are remarkably sort of, you know, capable of, of transmitting across long distances, allowing us to share. And uh, I think of it in two ways. One is if you looked at like who Harvard Business School sends most of its emails to, it's Harvard Business School. And if you actually even look at the second floor of the Rock Center, which is where I work, it sends most of its emails to the second floor of the Rock Center. And so just because technologies can be virtual or be weightless doesn't mean that it, it doesn't like somehow reinforce place. And you could see this very strong interaction between those two. And another way to kind of think about that is over the last uh, few decades, as these technologies have really sort of taken root, we've seen the, the property prices of premier places like you know, the, the southern tip of Manhattan or you know, Sand Hill Road or Market Street in San Francisco or Kendall Square in Boston, the relative prices of those areas compared to the rest of Boston or New York and also compared to the rest of the United States have never been as high as they are going into the COVID crisis. And that's a sense of while there's a lot of stuff that we're able to collaborate on remotely, if we're also able to distribute our products remotely, if we're, we're able to kind of you know, tackle huge markets because of all of this uh, kind of um, virtual access, then that may raise the premium for us to get together and make sure that we're really collaborating in real time and getting stuff done. So we'll have to see how all of this plays out. Remote work is almost certainly going to increase in the future, but I don't know that I would go from there to say that that's going to mean Manhattan will become less important uh, in the future. I think one of the other long or potentially long-term effects we touched on in the beginning is unemployment and how many people have lost their jobs due to this crisis. How permanent do you think these losses of employment will be? Will these people find their jobs just, just elsewhere once the economy sort of resurfaces um, from its current deep sleep or are we, are we looking towards more um, or higher levels of long-term unemployment? Bill, do you wanna 
on to that. Sure, I can start. I think we're about to find out uh, in that there's many businesses that we're going to have to observe as the world reopens in the United States. And this is happening across states at, at different rates and across cities at different rates, and also obviously across different types of businesses at different rates. How much are they able to sort of bounce back to where they were, bring furloughed workers uh, back uh, into the workforce and build? If we have a like a, a very damaging second wave of the crisis that causes businesses to go back into relapse or many more to close, then I think you're gonna see very, very substantial levels of dislocation. One of the surveys that a uh, few of my colleagues did along with some people from outside of HBS looked at in particular small businesses and how long they thought they could survive under various scenarios of this. And really the, the kind of the tipping point for their survival was often around three to four months. That's when their cash on in hand and PPP and the other kinds of assistance that they've gotten was going to run out. And if we go beyond that point and you're having it not be, hey, let's come back and get back to work. Work's going to be different, but we, we know you, you know us. Let's get this. Uh, let's get the restaurant back going. Let's get the gym back going. If it goes into something where we lose a lot of those businesses, then you're going to have a lot more of this longer term search and matching process for workers and learning new uh, new tacit knowledge about how the work is being conducted. And that's going to be a much more traumatic and drawn out process. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, ahead, I don't. Nancy. I think that Bill did a beautiful job of answering this. Um, I, you know, I don't have that much to add. I would just say that you know, it's been a massive disruption, right? Massive, and and I think that some businesses are not coming back, right? There are many restaurants, for example, that will not be able to come back, right, from this because it it has been too long, right? Um, there are. You know, just to give a, you know, an example, right, a, a concrete example, many of our favorite restaurants just, you know, they, they won't be able to survive this, right, especially if they haven't been able to do takeout or other kinds of, you know, things that have been able to sustain them during this time period. Um, there's also, uh, I, I'm on the board of some nonprofits, and this has been incredibly uh, challenging for cer certain nonprofits. Um, and they are rely, they're gonna rely on giving and charity even more, right? Than they already have to survive this crisis. And so, um, you know, it's, I, I think there may be a very uh, important opportunity and hopefully it will uh, be, a, there will be some redistribution of wealth, right? As people start to, you know, who have wealth start to realize I, I've, I've got to support these institutions. Otherwise they're going away and they're important to me. Right. I mean, that, that's my hope. I don't know that that will happen, but but I think that that it, it kind of has to happen if those institutions are are to survive. Um, and then the, the, the last piece of this is right now in the United States, we're seeing massive civil unrest um, in part because of, you know, police brutality and actions, but in part because of the massive economic, uh, you know, uh, inequality that certain parts of the the population are, are experiencing and the desperation that people are feeling around that. And so, you know, I think that the combination of those things has led to, you know, just what you're seeing in terms of the civil unrest that is playing out as we speak. So, I mean, I, I don't think any of us has a crystal ball and knows the future, but this is a this is a huge economic challenge, no question. I think the important thing is when we're discussing the COVID-19 crisis that obviously in terms of the workplace, this ties in with a lot of other developments that we already saw beforehand, like automation, like increased um, or increased use of technology and artificial intelligence. So maybe starting off with the last of those um, three points, Kate, what do you think artificial intelligence um, has, what kind of effect does it have on the workplace? And do you think we risk some sort of over-reliance on this um, particular technology? Well, so I think like with anything, there's opportunities and challenges associated with this. So what we've seen is that the opportunities are better decision-making, the, the new technologies allow for better decision-making, better coordination, better learning. Um, and those are all really positive. I think that 
these technologies can have some negative outcomes for workers if not implemented well by organizations. So just to give a concrete example, um, in healthcare, these um, new AI, AI technologies, machine learning technologies can be great for creating these decision support tools for doctors. And so, for example, in primary care, now uh, there's these great machine learning tools that allow very low level workers to help doctors uh, kind of serve up decisions to doctors that doctors can then vet. And that's great because it both allows for the upskilling of these frontline workers and it frees up the professional's time for you know, more difficult, more challenging work. Um, and that can be great. What I've also seen is that there needs to be some attention centrally to this to make sure that the work is reallocated in a way that works for everybody. So for example, if it's just implemented locally between a, a small set of doctors and medical assistants, what happens is there's work intensification for the frontline workers because they just got handed a whole lot of new tasks to use these uh, tools. Uh, but they have, there's nobody else to hand those tests off to. So there needs to be a central group that's looking, usually cross-disciplinary, that's trying to figure out which of these tests really still need to be done now that we have these great tools and how can we reallocate things fairly so that the workers get upskilled without this negative work intensification. Um, so I think that it's just more generally, the tools are very powerful and organizations can do a better or worse job. They can do a better job when they involve workers in the design and implementation of the tools. What do you think, or how do you think this interacts directly with things like the dehumanization of workers? Do you think there's a risk of us advancing technology into even further and companies relying more on capital rather than, than the labor force? Do you think that completely changes the conception of work that we have or what kind of effects do you think that that means for the wider you know, I guess um, there, there are people who are optimists and pessimists on this, right? That automation is gonna replace all the jobs and take all the tasks. And I, I think history has shown us that automation can take us so far and can't automate everything. Um, and that often new work is created around machines. And so what I think we'll see is, um, we will see a lot of the current work replaced. I think we'll also see new occupations coming up around these new tools. Um, you know, so just for give a concrete example, um, curation, like think about all the new algorithmic recording we have is creating this, you know, tons and tons of data um, that now we need groups to sort through and to figure out which, which of these things should we pay attention to. Um, another thing uh, that I've seen a job uh, becoming more important is the role of algorithmic translators so that you need people who really understand these tools to communicate between the developers of the tools and the frontline users in order for this to work. So I, I do see uh, a lot of these tasks going away and I also see a lot of work being created around those tasks to support the new tools. Now uh, I'm going uh, to, yeah. yeah. I'll jump in and say, I think our framing uh, for the future of work is, is very resonant with what Kate just described in that uh, we, we focused a lot on technology and also demographic changes and how they're impacting the, the, the workplace. And overall, we're, also, we're in, the, in, in the optimistic camp recognizing that no one has that crystal ball. We're in the optimistic camp for there being enough jobs out there in the future, uh, enough tasks that people are, are still going to uh, want to perform. Uh, and the challenge that we see is that getting from here to there uh, and doing so in a continual manner, because there is not going to be a fixed point, there is constantly moving out further, is something that we have, we're ill-equipped to do at the, at the speed that's necessary. So you can, you can look ahead and say there's lots of jobs that are in 15, 20 years. You can then look at the workforce that an organization has and says, how's that workforce going to be ready for that future? And that's a harder, it's harder to figure out how you're gonna connect those two, those two dots. And many institutions, all four of us are currently in the education sector in some way or not. We are not designed historically to operate at that sort of cadence or speed. So for many or companies it's gonna be about, can we help our workforce develop the skills that it needs to, to be able to cross that? And if we can, that's actually a very competitive advantage for our company. 
Like it's not that we can, you know, have some idea that we're going to replace one third of our workforce with this digital millennial that we have in mind. That's that's not a strategy that, that's ever going to be feasible. Instead, it's going to be what can we do to help our workforce be able to transition and, and accomplish all the things that Kate just described. And, and that's it's a big challenge for companies to pull off. I just want to comment on the training piece, which I think is so important here. One thing that these new technologies allow is also asynchronous online training. So um, right now, companies can have workers doing this training and paying for upskilling for workers to do, you know, uh, offline in between tasks in a way that, you know, the downside is, does that intensify the work of the workers? The upside of it is that companies may be willing, more willing to invest in worker training when workers are already working for them. So they know that the investments that they're making are ones that they're gonna benefit from. So I think the technologies are enabling this new training, which is great. Um, again, you know, just to mitigate the downsides, one could imagine that if companies are now uh, sponsoring all this training for workers, then they do have more control over those workers. So how do you, create opportunities for worker voice, worker forums, where they can have conflicts addressed and that kind of thing. So, uh, because as they get more dependent on the organizations, they need some kind of counterbalancing effect to kind of take back some of that power and authority. Yeah, and quickly, just to build on, on Kate's comment there, we, we see companies uh, increasingly striking almost an, uh, a new, in some cases, or different uh, bargain with the workers, being that we'll tell you what demands we have or how we're anticipating our, our skill base that it needs to look like in the future. We're going to give you access to a lot of these training tools. Um, your job is to make sure that you are, you know, someone that we're going to want to employ in, in, in the future. And so there's a shift to say, we want to create the environment that lets you accomplish uh, this task uh, and what you need to, uh, to be ready. Uh, but you have to be, be responsible for, um, for making sure that you're there. So you just mentioned that you're sort of in the optimistic camp and that there will be enough work in the future. But I think one of the main challenges is whether that work will be there for the right people. So what we see with the COVID-19 pandemic is a lot of the people who are being let go are in the service sector are sort of more um, low, low educated workers who might not be able to, to work in a world um, where those kind of jobs are mainly being done by machines. So do you think the fear even of, of automation, even if it might not be sort of justified for the overall economy, is still justified for some of those groups of people who might be left out by that? Well, I think a, a couple of things. First, while I uh, am myself a, a technological optimist, uh, one of the things that we do in my class is look at the range of forecasts uh, that people have had pre-COVID-19 for the number of jobs in 2030. And it's plus or minus two billion. So like, and these are very smart, intelligent people that are looking at the future and seeing different outcomes. And that goes back to, we mentioned earlier, uncertainty rising with COVID. There already was lots of uncertainty about this future. And I think for policymakers and business leaders, being able to uh, think through that uncertainty and plan for, even if you believe we're going to be in a, a, a full job future, what happens if we start to see signals that are going in the opposite direction and how would you uh, respond to that? In terms of the particular implications of COVID, uh, absolutely I worry about uh, the disproportionate impact that this has had on um, service sector workers and workers that were already um, less economically advantaged uh, th than others. Uh, one would hope that somehow also some of the essential worker aspect and the fact that we label people as essential workers will allow us to bring, you know, sort of new light, new support, even some codification into regulations and, and laws support to, to be able to help there. The other thing that I worry a lot about is actually the education sector uh, and the fact that a lot of people went home uh, and in our cases, uh, at least two of us, and I don't know about Kate, are have homeschools that are going on in, in neighboring rooms right now. Uh, but in, if you're in a, a poor environment, uh, if you don't have that kind of home support, this is a very challenging time period. And you may have even relied on, on the school for a nutritious lunch every day. 
Uh, and if we're losing that kind of, uh, of support for the lower income groups, it's not just about today's workers, it's about those that will come into the workforce over the next, say, two to six years, and how much education will they have? Will they have been disadvantaged a lot by this? Yeah, I, that, that's a great point. I, I mean, I, just to build on that, uh, you know, in, uh, in the city of Philadelphia, which is a very poor um, city public school district, that has been a huge challenge, right? There are a lot of kids who don't have, uh, you know, good internet access. Um, they don't have the, the school lunch program was a huge problem. They ended up having to do brown bag lunches at like depots where people would go and line up in socially distanced ways to get a lunch, right? So that they could, you know, make sure that these kids were getting fed, but it was very, very problematic. Um, and, you know, continue, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing continues to be, and what education they were getting is unclear, right? Because you had to, you had to really equalize things so that some of the students weren't being disadvantaged. And then all the students were basically having a, a shadow, a, a shadow of the education that they were supposed to be getting at, you know, my children go to a, a, a private school. So I didn't have, I was able, you know, I'm economically able to make sure that didn't happen to my children. Right. And so, you know, we didn't have the same problem. And so there is a, there's a divide, there's a digital divide and there is a economic divide, which has always been the case in this country. But I think that this crisis has really highlighted those divisions and is exacerbating that divide and widening the gap between the, the technological haves and have nots. And that is, we see this with school children, we see this with frontline workers, um, and we see this with people who are losing their jobs. And so it is, it is a, it's a very serious concern, right, in terms of how we recover from that. Uh, and I think that institutions have to be a part of it at some level because individual companies can't do everything, right? And so you need to have institutional support to, to try to build a recovery. There's been a lot of debate on how to deal with this kind of future of work that for many will, as you say, probably mean either working less or not working at all because they just don't fit the future job market. So maybe talking about two, two solutions that have come up. Um, Jacinda Ardern, New Zealand's Prime Minister, has been in the news a lot about her suggestion of a four day working week um, to sort of not just recover the economy after COVID, but also deal with reduced work and trying to boost a local tourism industry. Bill, do you think this is a good idea or um, do you think this is a solution that could work for other things um, such as automation in the long term? Well, let me first uh, give the caveat, but I don't know the details of, of the New Zealand proposal, uh, but uh, my reaction to it is, is a bit of a, of a mixed perspective. Uh, and on one hand, one of the things we've observed over the last I think 60 years, uh, it, well, actually even longer it, to the degree that we can believe the older data, is a reduction in the amount of time people are working. And I, I know that from the 60s, 1965 onwards, it's been about 10 hours on average. And yet the five-day work week has remained remarkably sticky. Uh, and so, you know, kind of challenging that a little bit uh, seems an interesting I I idea. The, the part that I, I worry about a proposal like that is that it almost has as an underlying assumption that there is a certain fixed allotment of labor and that we are now trying to divide that labor up in more smaller chunks or slices. When I like to think of the, the, the labor, you know, we, we want to try to be grow, growing the labor opportunities overall and making sure that, uh, that people have access to this, but not necessarily mandating certain uh, maximum numbers of hours or, or something, uh, something like that. And I guess I would look towards the future and say, maybe this could work for New Zealand in the short run, but I would be worried if they were putting stuff into rules or regulations or laws that in hopefully two years time, maybe it's five years time, as the economy got back into a full cycle, now you've created you know, regulatory barriers that could be very challenging uh, for, for companies. It was only a few months ago that we had an unemployment rate, at least in the United States, that was hovering around 4%. And many of the questions were about like, how are we gonna get more people to get into the workforce that are currently outside of the labor force? And so I, 
New Zealand and many countries have demographics where the population is going to be aging. And that's going to put a premium on making sure we have uh, people that, that, that want to work and could be in the workforce the right opportunities. A suggestion that's been much more debated in the US, especially in sort of this presidential election cycle, is the universal basic income. Um, and I know you've written a paper comparing that to sort of federal job guarantees. Could you tell us a little bit about your findings and whether you think this would be a good solution to automation? Sure, this is a, this is a case study. Uh, it's not a, a formal academic paper, but it's a case study that we use in class. And it, uh, it, it's, the title of it is Universal Basic Income, Federal Jobs Guarantees, or None of the Above. Uh, and it's meant to kind of help students think about some of the big proposals that have been advanced and what are the underlying issues uh, that, that they should be thinking about uh, with them. So let me take UBI uh, as a starting point, uh, which obviously Andrew Yang uh, made very popular uh, during his presidential run, but it's actually it goes back to the uh, 16th century, was at least the first time that we know of somebody proposing something that, uh, that looks like this. And really what we want students to appreciate about UBI is a, a couple things. One is it's expensive. When I mean it's expensive, it is really expensive. And, and some incredibly smart people can have this idea that Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, and a few other like tech billionaires could fund this. But if you think about establishing for uh, US uh, population age 18 or older, $1,000 per month in UBI. And so it's 12,000 a year. And to put that in context, the federal poverty line is about 25,000. So you're, you're, you're only halfway to the federal poverty line. Uh, that cost is about $3 trillion. And we currently, as a US, only take in in taxes about $3.5 trillion. So if you wanted to just add this on, it's an enormous uh, expansion. And the other thing that, you know, so you, you get into like the students are asked to propose what their UBI scheme would be, how they would fund it, like where they would go and, um, uh, and, and acquire either new revenue sources or spending cuts. The other thing we want people to kind of grapple with with UBI is that it is a rethinking of how we approach redistribution. In the United States, most policies are either directed towards uh, the needy, towards the poor, uh, or they are with specific groups like children. Uh, or the elderly. Like they're, they're mean testing, they're also targeted in, in their nature. And under a lot of UBI schemes, you would be taking uh, resources away from people that are currently very dependent on those resources. In other words, they're going to they're going to receive less in a UBI world than they currently receive. And you're redistributing some of that towards everyone else in the economy. And I could look at myself and say, I probably don't need to be getting a UBI check coming in. So there may be some phase outs or something, sort of, but it's trying to have us think about those types of uh, implementations. Uh, to just to quickly talk also about federal jobs guarantee, it's very uh, it's a very popular idea and it's one that we have had uh, at, in the Great Depression and other time periods, uh, it step up. It's It's got its own kind of big questions uh, that you have to think about. Uh, it, if you think about like our, the 40 million people that you just uh, said were on unemployment right now, uh, that's 20 times the size of the U.S. federal government. So we have about 2 million federal government workers in the U.S. If you were to think about trying to provision jobs for those 40 million, th that's, that's a, a, a very big task. And you have to think about like, what are the long-term, you know, kind of ways you would deal with uh, inflows and outflows. So you have to come up first off with like, what task would someone be starting into? But once, let's say, an economic recovery starts and you have put a lot of people to work on various projects, how long, you know, can they give like one week notice and then go and do something else? And then what, what's left with that task that was there beforehand? Uh, and how are you going to be able to put? So again, students need to kind of grapple with, with those things. And then there's other things that it, fall in that none of the above camp, which would be, let's take the earned income tax credit or things that we already have in place and try to expand that. And I think what we overall work uh, as a class to kind of uh, appreciate is, one, it's, it's awfully easy to kill an idea. But to our earlier kind of notion of no one knows what 2030 looks like, let's not be so fast to do that. Uh, and I think we really need to be experimenting with a lot of these programs in small ways uh, or even medium-sized ways so that if we start getting that signal that in fact we're in one of those more difficult 2030 environments, 
we've already got some understanding that we can uh, uh, that, that we can put behind it. But the second you know part behind that is that we don't want people to underestimate how difficult it would be not only sort of economically, but politically to pull off and administer some of these things that seem so magical and so easy and so easy to rally support around, uh, except for if you were to think about how you're going to approach funding one of these programs and what the consequences would be for, uh, for people. So before we end, um, there are two questions from our members that were submitted in advance that I think fit in quite nicely with the discussion we've had. The first is on from Johnny at New College and is on managerial trust. He's asking, how will work oversight change given how during COVID-19 remote work relies on managerial trust? Will there be a culture shift in the relationship between employer and employee? Nancy, do you want to maybe answer that question? Okay. Sure. I'll, I'll take a, a, a shot, at, shot at it. Um, you know, I think managerial trust is a really important component of remote work, as I said earlier. And one of the things that's, um, I'm an optimist, uh, and I think that one of the things I have seen uh, throughout this period is that the, the relatively seamless transition home, I think, surprised a lot of managers. I think a lot of managers were very pleasantly surprised with how engaged people were, how, how, how much um, focus that they were bringing to, to the, their work um, given very, very difficult circumstances. And I think that that, that, um, that positive updating, I, I think, will be, be very helpful. That said, these things, you know, I'm an academic and so it, it always depends and it's always complicated, right? There are, there are also, I think, ch continue to be challenges. There's reasons that managers are often concerned about, you know, remote work. It is harder to coordinate, no question. You know, uh, even with the amazing technologies we have, you know, we, it, it, it's much more difficult to have some of the, um, to have some of the, uh, the different, um, sorry, I just got an email that ding. So let me, let me just start over. It, it's, it's much more difficult to coordinate with, with coworkers um, when you're not all on the, the meeting at the same time, right? Or where you're, when you're on different schedules, right? If your kid's schooling schedule is not enabling you to be um, co-present co at a meeting with your colleagues and your work in, involves coordination or with your manager, it's gonna be really more challenging. And so, you know, I, I, I don't think that this is a panacea. I don't think that, you know, managers are gonna automatically say, I've seen the light and of course everybody should work from home if they want. You know, I, I, I think that, that it, it will help with some of the trust issues, but I don't think it's going to completely overcome all of them because there are real challenges um, that many workers and organizations will face with, with doing this long-term. And I think that Bill's earlier point is really important to bring back in here around the fact that we have pre-existing teams that were sent, were sent home <laughs> uh, and, and having relationships and routines and um, ways of working and coordinating that have been established builds trust as well. And so when you don't have that, when, when you have everybody who's you know, never necessarily worked together, that can that can be a different type of trust issue. And I think that, that we need to think carefully about those two different types of situations. So Nancy's talking here about the knowledge workers. And so let me talk about the other group of the essential workers. I think in terms of trust, what we've seen with the essential workers is that early on, uh, because of this lack of PPE, in many cases, these workers were not in safe conditions. And I think that has betrayed some of the trust between workers and their employers. So I think that going forward, they really need to um, increase the trust by doing things like having formal safety procedures in place, by providing adequate pay and even increased hero pay for situations that are unsafe because of COVID if we get um, some kind of recurrence in the fall as many are expecting. There should be paid um, family and medical leave for everybody in these essential jobs. 
And then finally, there needs to be voice mechanisms so that these workers have a chance to provide input into their working conditions and also have dispute resolution processes for any kinds of conflicts that arise going forward. I agree on, on with both uh, Nancy and Kate's comments. And let me just add a couple of like, I think additional leadership uh, pieces that, that I would think through. One, uh, and this relates in, in some cases to what Kate just described where people made missteps or in Nancy's case where you just didn't have everything like fully figured out. I think leaders can show some humility uh, and you know, kind of be a little bit open and candid right now. And we're working through this with our own teams at, at Harvard Business School of saying, you know, we, we, we made it through the last two months, two and a half going on three months now, uh, but we don't know we got everything right uh, in terms of how our research team is operating. So let's check in and see what, what needs to be changed because it's likely to be another two or three months before we're back on campus. Uh, and so how can we how can we do this better? And so approaching with that humility, I think, can be uh, can be an important uh, a part of, of this uh, this aspect uh, going forward. The second and final question is from Sharice that's in Edmund Hall, and he's asking, will this crisis act as a catalyst for the death of the office with current technology facilitating work from almost any location? Are offices still necessary for effective work or just expensive remnants of outdated business practices? Kate, do you want to go first? Well, I mean, you know, it's a little bit what I was saying before about I do yeah. think it's really opening the door to the larger use of these labor market platforms now that managers are seeing that they can coordinate this work because echoing Nancy's point, I think a, a big reason that that hasn't happened more to date is, is because of these transaction and coordination costs. Um, so I think we will see more of it. I think another thing in addition to the coordination costs are that there's often a lot of resistance by current employees to the use of new remote workers like freelancers. So there also needs to be in place, you know, involving those current employees in decisions about what kinds of uh, work are we going to outsource and how are we going to integrate those people who are working remotely into the current team? I think we're seeing an interesting interaction of um, the growth of, of remote work also with the increased, what's often called the projectification of work. So work being treated more in, in project formats or in discrete bytes. And that opens up uh, a number of gig type platforms or relationships that uh, companies can have with workers that they didn't uh, traditionally uh, traditionally have. What I'm looking for over the next, uh, I guess, year is, uh, it, it, or, and think also where we are right now in this transition. When we all went home in early March, we, we were often taking a work style that was built around the office. Uh, you know, it, 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 what we're gonna increasingly see are people trying to appreciate uh, if we're going to be in a hybrid form uh, in the future, what what does the what does the best hybrid form look like? Should we rethink how we're designing the work and its structure and, and the allocation of tasks? And I suspect that a bunch of things in telemedicine with children's appointments and the things we talked about earlier, as well as some of the essential care work that Kate, like that's that's going to have a different format in the future. Uh, and that's something for us to celebrate and try to make sure it's the best that it can be for the workers. And for other things, we're going to be like, it's not really worked that well for us to be doing this all from our kitchens and, you know, back bedrooms and whatever else that we've been trying to accomplish. And so for that, I think the workplace uh, and the office is still going to be an essential part of the future. Yeah, and, and I would just, I would, I really agree with both what Kate and Bill have said here. Um, I hope we won't see the death of the office. Um, I, I love the office. Um, I, I, I think that there is something really, um, although it's, in, it's interesting, I'm totally fine here at home, but I also miss the office, right? And so I have both of these sentiments. And I think that we will see in the future some hybrid form because we do know from past work on virtual teams that you know it is better if you have some face-to-face -face interaction with people, some establishment of relationships before you, you scatter uh, to, to the winds, right? And so, you know, there are really, I think, very valuable functions that the office can play. And, and I, I hope that, um, 
that that it will continue, right? That we're going to be able to congregate. I was on a um, I was on a, uh, uh, a, a an online learning platform last night at at eight o'clock at night with Taiwan, uh, who has managed the COVID pandemic so much better than we have in the West. Okay, and and they they were all sitting. There were thirty four people in a boardroom sitting together, and I was so jealous. Oh that they could be together, right? And I was w- looking at them and, and I, I, was, I was saying, here I am sitting in my kitchen and you guys are together and this is amazing. And you know, I, I'm hoping we can do that again. So I, I think hopefully we won't see the death of the office, but I do think we're gonna see change. And I do think that this pandemic um, has been an, an enormous shock that's left a lot of uncertainty and some really, challenging times for us, but hopefully will also lead to massive change in terms of how we work. You know, the upskilling that Kate and Bill were talking about before, it's been accelerated, right? The, the, this, this upskilling has been tremendously accelerated in this period. And so, you know, we, I think we're going to see that, um, that this is also going to have change for, it, it's going to be changed for good as well. Right, and, and I think that's my hope for both the office and the future. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today, but thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. It was a really interesting discussion and I hope we can host you at some point in person at the Oxford Union rather than just via Zoom to maybe get that feeling of the, of the office or in-person meeting back.